Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ashley Humphreys. Um, like Dr. Ross mentioned before, some of this um, might, information might be a little generalized for more experienced um, individuals, but we wanted to make sure we to accommodate everybody. Um, my discussion will be on the determination of biological sex from the human skeleton. So just the general anthropological protocol that we go over, first of all, is the bone human. Um, what context is it in? Is it um, even of forensic context? Is it prehistoric? Um, how many individuals are present? And then we go into the biological profile, which will be the most important to us in our discussions throughout the day. Um, and since I'm discussing biological sex determination, there are two main means for, for uh, determining sex. And those are through visual assessment or anthroposcopic and um, measurements, anthropometric. And then again, as you go through the anthropological protocol, you have these other uh, areas that narrow down the field of missing persons so we can identify an individual and also provide information on um, perhaps how they ended up where they were. Um, kind of a big deal in um, uh, anthropology is the difference between biological sex and gender. Uh, in anthropology, we'll prefer to use biological sex because it is um, the actual physical and anatomical difference between males and females. And this is based on the type of gametes produced by the gonads, so ova in the female and spermatozoa in the male. Gender, on the other hand, is more of a social construct and it's uh, specifies the socially, socially and culturally prescribed roles men and women are to follow, and these roles can be influenced by an individual sex. So one of the main areas, or main reasons why we can determine sex from the skeleton is because of sexual dimorphism between males and females. Um, there, we look at size and then architecture. Males are generally larger, um, have more muscle markings are, are stronger, and um, then females tend to be uh, more gracile. And then we also look at architecture, and the female pelvis is the most um, architecturally different area that we look at because the female pelvis is designed to bear children, and so it obviously needs to be a lot wider to let the baby come through. When we're determining sex, we have to be very careful of population differences because there are going to be different levels of sexual dimor dimorphism um, across populations. Here I just have a, a photograph of a European female and a European male, or an Asian male, excuse me, to try to show that the Asian male appears a little bit more gracile and perhaps some people may um, resemble more female morphology but we just need to keep in mind that when we're looking across populations that the, sex, the levels of sexual dimorphism could be different. When it comes to um, determining sex from juvenile skeletons, uh, it can be very difficult. There are methods to use, but sometimes they're no better than chance and you, quite, you don't want to go to court with that. So, um, it's a realm that we sometimes stay away from a little bit, but as, um, well, Dr. Ross had mentioned to use the 3D ID for um, determining ancestry. For, um, for juveniles, you can't really quite do that with the, the sex. So with our visual indicators, the skull and the pelvis together can provide fairly great accuracy, you can see 90 to 100 percent. The pelvis alone um, would be better than the skull because of the morphological differences because of bearing children. Um, and then the skull alone can also provide um, fairly great accuracy. And then as we go down to the long bones, it gets a, um, a lot less. So I'll go over the sex differences of the pelvis first. Um, here I have a photograph of um, the anterior, superior, and inferior views 
of the male and female pelvis to show the differences. The first photo on the left is um, indicating the subpubic angle. And for the females, you can see that it's much wider than the males on the bottom. The center pictures are showing the position of the sacrum. And um, for the females, it's tilted back. And then when you're looking into this pelvic inlet, you can see that the female pelvis has a lot more space, again, related to childbirth. And then the picture on the right is just showing the positioning of the ilia. And males are more narrower and um, uh, taller. And then the females are wider and a little bit broad, uh, shorter and broader. Uh, one of the features that is uh, very commonly used is the greater sciatic notch, which is located right here. And we use a set of standards, um, Bikestraw and Ubelacher, that shows the, a range of width, and we choose from one to five, um, the, whether it's female or intermediate or male. So the wider it is, the more um, likely it is to be female. And the more narrow, the more likely male. And um, that's, again, related to childbirth. And you can see in this picture up here, um, the female is much wider than the male greater sciatic notch. The preauricular sulcus is located um, inferior to the um, auricular surface where the sacrum articulates with, with the two halves of the pelvis. And uh, these traits are very important because we don't find the pelvis just fully intact, all articulated. It's generally going to be in, in sections, so two halves of the pelvis, so two off coxa, and then the sacrum that lies in the middle. So the, pre, the preauricular sulcus, if it's present, it's, it's probably me, uh, female. If it's absent, then it's mostly male. Uh, this one, I don't like to necessarily say that if it's absent, it's, it's definitely a male, because you can have a female that does not have this groove or depression inferior to the auricular, auricular surface. And so here the male, you do not see a depression. And here the female, you see um, a slight groove. The ischiopubic ramus is located inferior to the pubis, right here, on, if you see this photograph at the top right corner. And uh, on males, this is wider or blunt. And then on females, it's uh, more narrow or sharp, just related to the overall um, must, or that males are larger. The pubic body, which is located here in the front, Males, this, um, this area tends to be uh, triangular in shape. And then on females, it's rectangular or square. And um, this is related to the uh, subpubic angle. If you see this picture, you can see the differences um, between the angles. And so uh, the female is more of a square shape because the subpubic um, angle or con concavity is going to um, be larger than the male. So here I have a radiograph. Um, can somebody please tell me what, based on the uh, greater sciatic notch, what sex you believe this individual, well, A and B to be? Anybody? <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> on the left, left and female on Thank you. Um, that it, it's um, they're both it's both female. So I I believe um, it is it, the right and the the it's you. This is a little difficult because you're not handling it. You know the angle could be a little off, but they are both female. This one obviously yes, that would be an extreme uh, example of a female. So this is the the uh, pubic bone or the pubis. And based on that photograph, can you tell me if that's all you had? Not in the 
Yes, correct. So um, this is more of a, a um, more of a square or rectangular shape. And um, you can see the concavity right here for the subcubic angle. If you had more of a photograph, I'm sure it, it would have been easier. Okay, how about this one? This, it's, like I said, it's a little tough from the angles. Um, I don't blame you on this one. But I see a slight depression here. If maybe the photograph were turned a little bit, there we could see it more of the preauricular sulcus. Um, but I do believe this individual is female. Um, now I'll go over some of the uh, visual or morphological differences between um, males and females using the skull. Here I have the photograph that we use from the standards uh, book by Bikestra and Ubelacher. Um, the nuchal crest or, is located on the posterior aspect of the skull. And I'll go through all of these individually. Then we have the mastoid process and um, superorbital margin, the glabella region, or superorbital ridge, and uh, the mental eminence. And these are related to robusticity, so males are more robust than females. The nuchal area, located here, you can see the difference between the male and the female, where the female is more smooth has less um, apparent muscle markings. And then the male will have um, more prominent muscle markings. And sometimes this area will have a hook. Here's another angle. The mastoid process, which is located here. If you feel behind your head, you can feel it. Um, females, it's smaller and uh, less projecting, as you can see on the right side. And on males, it's um, thicker, larger, or more projecting. Sometimes it might not be projecting, but it may be uh, wider. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The superorbital margin, which is located on um, the uh, superior portion of the eye orbit, on Males, this area will be thick and rounded. And this one, I, I have to feel it to actually um, assess this one. And then on females, this area will often be a sharp bridge. Brow ridges. Um, you can often just see this by looking at anybody. The males t uh, typically have um, a large or pronounced brow ridge, but not always, uh, especially between populations. So one thing to keep in mind. And then females, it's often small or there, there is none. We can also look at the shape of the frontal bone um, right here in this area. On the males, it, it's uh, more slanted. And then on females, it's uh, higher, rounder, or more um, bulbous, projecting. You can see that difference. And then we also look at the shape of the mandible. Males tend to have a more square um, shape here, and females more rounded or pointed. I like to flip the, the, um, the mandible over and look at the inferior aspect as shown in this picture, and then here's um, the superior view. So looking at this photograph, can you tell me male or female and why? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Um, the brow ridge is straight up down with very little propeller prominence and the mastoid looks kind of small. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's pretty smooth back here. There is a, a little bit of an occipital bun, but um, other than that, the muscle markings are very smooth. How about this photograph? Okay, so it's this this individual is male, um, large brow ridges, um, a rough nuchal area, and 
large um, mastoids. So then we also have metric approaches to uh, determining sex, and these um, are quantified approaches. And early comparisons were based on single measurements or indices uh, from numerous areas uh, of the body, both cranial and postcranial. Uh, recent analyses have taken advantage of the multivariate statistics, which can allocate an individual to um, uh, sex or ancestry. And accurate measurements require knowledge of the skeleton and its various features and how to locate the, the landmarks properly. So an example of metric analysis of the postcrania would be the femoral uh, head diameter located here. Um, so you just measure this with a sliding caliper. And um, here's an example of a European American. If the measurement is less than 42.5, then the individual is likely female. And as you look down the list, um, you can have probable female, then intermediate, probable male. And then if it's greater than 47.5, it is uh, likely male. This is a similar method used for the, hum the humeral head vertical diameter. And again, um, once you take this measurement using the sliding calipers, if it's less than 43 millimeters, then likely female, and so on. Uh, the issue of pubic index uses um, the measurements of the pubic length from here to where um, the point of fusion between the three bones of the os coxa, the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium, and then it uses the ischium length from here to the point of fusion. And um, so you enter, you divide pubic length by ischium length times 100, and males tend to be less than 84 and females greater than 94. However, this is one of those where um, ancestry is good to know when applying this method because they will vary. Cranial measurements. Um, allow researchers to summarize the dimensional elements of sexual dimorphism. And it uses size and shape analysis that's based on the linear distances between two landmarks. And these linear measurements are then plugged into discriminant functions, uh, function equations, and then it produces sectioning points. And then from there, um, you can determine if uh, it's greater than the sectioning point or less than a sectioning point, whether the individual is male or female. Uh, this is very much ancestry dependent, and uh, so therefore you need to be aware of standards that are based on the inappropriate reference population. And so you would measure, for example, here's Bregma uh, to Bayesian for cranial height, um, and uh, um, Urion to Urion for cranial breadth and so on. And as an example here, you can plug them into the discriminant functions. And um, the sum of all values comes to 9076. And since it's greater than 8171, it's likely that the person was male. And then we move on to 3D ID which um, takes, the linear, takes the landmarks that we use for the linear measurements, um, and it provides information about the relative position of those landmarks. With the traditional um, linear measurements uh, used for traditional craniometrics, you um, don't get the information about where they're actually positioned. You're only getting how wide the cranium is or how long the cranium is. Um, but we know that the actual posi positioning of the landmarks in, in 3D space provides, can provide a little more information. 
So with the 3D measurements, we then use a geometric morphometrics, which Dr. Ross will discuss more later. And um, we'll use size and shape analysis that uses the Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z, of the anatomical landmarks um, to give us, um, to allocate the individual male or female or their ancestry. So then the X, Y, and Z coordinates are then compared to a known, known reference population. Um, if the reference population isn't there, it will try to assign it to, um, to the closest uh, population it can, but obviously if it's not there, you're, it might not be um, as strong or as accurate. And those are the cited um, references. I flew right through that. Um, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> so we just want, you want to be able to recognize these things uh, before you go applying the 3D analyses um, to have an understanding of where we're coming from and to have prior knowledge because you need this prior knowledge of, well, could the individual be male or female when you're using the program? Okay. All right. Thank you.